Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mark Kester, and welcome to the Players NIL podcast. I'd like to welcome my special guest today and partner, Mitt Winter. Mitt, welcome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Well, I appreciate it. You know, we, we've uh, developed a little bit of relationship here and had several conversations. Obviously, I follow all of your work. And uh, two weeks ago, we announced a partnership where you're going to be one of our educational pillar leaders, leading the uh, tax, legal, and compliance pillar, which is your area of expertise. But before we get into that, maybe just share with our audience a little bit of your background in terms of athletics. I know you're a college basketball player. Some of the thoughts that went into where you went, uh, what you studied, and law school, and, and some of the projects that you've worked on in your professional career. Sure. Um, yeah, like, like you said, um, athletics have been a huge part of my life. You know, as a kid, grew up playing all the different sports, uh, basketball, baseball, football, lots of other ones. Um, you know, as I got into high school, kind of focused on baseball and basketball, and then eventually just basketball. I got towards the end of my high school career. Um, after high school, I, I received a basketball scholarship to play at William & Mary, which is a Division One school out in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, so played out there for four years. Uh, after graduation, I went to law school at the University of San Francisco, um, out in San Francisco, California, obviously. Um, had a good time out there and graduated from there in 2005. And after graduation, I started working for a law firm out in San Francisco, uh, named Bingham McCutcheon. Uh, no longer exists anymore. Most of the, the firm merged into a, another big firm named Morgan Lewis. Uh, but it was out there in San Francisco where I got my start in the college sports law space. Um, while I was working at Bingham McCutcheon, we actually represented the NCAA in a couple of cases. Uh, one of those cases was a big antitrust case about the NCAA's rule that limits uh, Division I football or FBS football teams from giving 80, 85 football scholarships. So that case was trying to get rid of that rule. Um, obviously that rule didn't get changed. That case ended up settling. Um, and then the first kind of taste of the college sports law space related to athlete compensation um, was the, a case named White versus NCAA that I worked on while I was out there in San Francisco. Uh, it was another big antitrust case brought by a few uh, former college athletes um, related to the, the limit on what schools could give their athletes as an athletic scholarship. Um, that case also ended up settling, so none of the rules changed at that point. Um, in 2011, I moved to Kansas City, which is where I live now, which is close to where I grew up in Topeka, Kansas. Um, so, you know, closer to some grandparents and a little cheaper cost of living than San Francisco with having three kids that were all born out in San Francisco. Um, so it's been a good move. Um, and when I moved back to Kansas City, I started working for a law firm named Polsonelli, which is another big national law firm. And a few of uh, that firm's clients at the time were the Big 12 Conference and Conference USA. And so while I was there, I worked on all of their legal matters. Um, so wide variety of things from the O'Bannon case, the Alston case, which obviously um, a lot of people, especially in the NIL, NIL world and college sports world are probably familiar with both of those cases. Uh, but then also worked on uh, TV broadcast contracts, conference realignment stuff, other, other matters as well. Um, then in about 2019, I made the move to my current firm, um, which is a, a much smaller firm in the Kansas City area than the two previous firms I've worked at. And at about the time I was making the move from Polsonelli to my current firm, Kenny Hertz Perry, um, it was when NIL was starting to really be talked about as a thing that was going to happen and that college athletes were going to be able to start monetizing their NILs and enter into endorsement deals and, and things like that. And, you know, it was the, the NCAA was talking about changing their rules. And then obviously the different states started um, passing their laws with California being the first. And then that just kind of started the big domino effect uh, of other states introducing bills and passing their laws. And then uh, brought us to, you know, July 1, 2021, last summer when the NCAA 
changed its rules. It was around the time a lot of some of the state laws were going to go into effect. And from, from that point on, it's been a, you know, a wild ride. Um, a lot of, a lot of developments in just, you know, 10 months in the NIL market. And so I think, um, what you're doing with the players in IL and what, what our group is trying to do with this education piece um, is great because with all the different state laws, the NCAA rules, different school policies, there are so many rules for people to keep track of and people um, you know, don't know what all those rules are and how they affect them. And um, so I, I think it's a great time to educate people um, on what those rules are. Great. Well, your background is, is perfect for uh, this space and, you know, fortuitous that NIL happened as you were, you know, having this career. I have a question for you that I don't know the answer to. Who coined the phrase name, image, and likeness? Where'd that come from? Do you know? Um, it just comes from, so name, image, and likeness really refers to what's known as the right of publicity um, wow. in the law. And that's all governed by state law. There's no uh, federal right to publicity it's all, all state law and those those uh statutes or, or case law talking about the right of publicity they all refer to your name image and likeness as something that you control and if people want to use that they have to or commercialize that they have to, to pay you for the use of your name image and likeness so that's where that term comes from so we're 10 or so months into officially nil being a real thing What's surprised you in the first 10 months? Uh, I think the biggest surprise is how quickly people identified some loopholes in the NCAA's rules and the state laws. And boosters got together and formed, you know, the NIL collectives, um, which, you know, everybody's been talking about recently. You know, people knew that boosters were going to get involved, um, in the NIL world, but I think most people thought it was going to be, you know, a booster at this school owns a big business and he, through that business would sign athletes to NIL deals. I don't think people envisioned that a bunch of boosters would get together, have a big pool of money sitting there and that they would then use that, that pool of money to form a separate third party business, the collective. And then that collective would do its own deals with the athletes. Um, I think that has been, you know, a, a big development and that's what's been talked about in the news a lot. Um, so to me, that that's kind of been the biggest surprise. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see and track that as it goes forward. So really we've got two uh, silos of money. Now we've got uh, the collectives, which I refer to as booster clubs on steroids. Right? Yep. That's exactly and what they are. Right. And then, but then you do have traditional business relationships you know, there are brands looking for promotional relationships and we're probably going to focus at the players NIL on those traditional relationships, unless collectives decide that they want to educate their athletes because they're finding that the athletes are not prepared to execute. But the, the traditional business relationship is the one that we want to focus on. And that is, you know, someone decides that midwinter can help them sell products and they're willing to pay you for that a traditional business transaction happens every day in the real world right yeah, and now right. that student app now that student athletes can do it uh, and legally do it you know what do you what are some of the pitfalls what are you what are you worried about in that traditional model um from the athlete standpoint it's really um signing a contract or a deal that may have some terms that are not really athlete friendly um, you know, a big one is if you sign an exclusive deal, um, you know, if you're thinking about it, a college student, you know, back when I was in college and I was presented with this deal and someone wants to pay me, I'd be like, I would jump at that opportunity. I, you know, I might not even read the contract. I would just, just sign it. or I wouldn't, you know, maybe not ask anybody to, to help me with it. Um, so that happens all the time. And I think it's really important that the athletes have number one education about things they need to look out for when they're reviewing the deals. Um, and then number two, to have someone that can possibly assist them in that review, whether that is an attorney, a parent, someone they trust, um, whoever it is, someone else that, that's knowledgeable that can help them 
through that negotiation and review review process. So like one thing I mentioned, just mentioned is an exclusivity provision in a deal. If you sign a deal with a brand in a certain category of brand, let's say it's an apparel company and it has an exclusivity provision, you can't work with any other apparel companies until that, that deal is over. Um, so you're locking yourself into working with that one apparel company. And maybe after you sign this deal, some other apparel companies that are offering a better deal come to you. You can't sign it because the deal you signed has an exclusivity provision. Um, another important part for the athletes is paying taxes. Um, you know, some of these deals, you know, athletes are making a pretty significant amount of money and you have to set aside some of that money to pay your taxes when, when tax time comes. Um, you're going to get a 1099 because you're an independent contractor. You're not an employee. So they're not paying your taxes for you. So that's your responsibility. You need to keep your 1099s um, for tax time and, and make sure you're taking care of things like that. So those are just a few of the, the pitfalls um, that are awaiting athletes with NIL deals. And so it's, you know, it's important that they're aware of those and educated on those. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great point. So, you know, we know that the, there's going to be a lot of pressure for NIL to go towards younger kids, right? People are going to try and lock, lock up the, uh, the superstar 16, 17 year old. What happens when a kid's uh, under the age of 18? His parents have to sign that contract, I assume? Yeah. In uh, most states, a minor can't sign an enter into a contract. So the athlete would have to have a, a parent sign um, yeah. off on a contract like that for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I got asked a question the other day, and I don't know the answer to this either, but in all of your work, which is extensive in your research, tell me the advantages or tell me the, 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 the opportunities between men's and women's NIL deals. It seems to me like there are significant women's opportunities out there, maybe closer than scholarship opportunities and athletic opportunities. Yeah, there definitely are. There are very significant opportunities for women. Um, so much of, of NIL, um, especially the types of traditional deals that we're talking about where, where a brand wants to do a deal with an athlete is based on social media following and social media engagement that, that an athlete has. And a lot of the college athletes that have the biggest social media followings, the biggest brands on social media and all the engagement are female athletes. Um, you know, Paige Becker's UConn women's basketball player is a great example. She has some, some huge deals, um, you know, StockX, Gatorade, a bunch of other ones. Um, but then there are some other athletes in, you know, non-revenue sports that might not as be, be as well known to, you know, your general college sports fan, but also have huge deals. Um, there are a lot of college gymnasts that have some really big deals. Uh, there's a, a gymnast at LSU named Olivia Dunn. Um, and she has some, some giant deals. Um, and then there are, are a couple, there's twin basketball players that went to Fresno state and the Cavender twins, they have huge TikTok, Instagram, other social media followings, and they have a, a number of, of big deals. They just transferred to the university of Miami. Um, but there are, you know, plenty of opportunities for, for female athletes, um, to enter into NIL deals. Yeah, that's, that's my gut feeling, and, and that's awesome. And, uh, you know, and I think the other thing that comes out of that conversation, that is you don't have to be, you know, a five-star recruit to profit and, you know, market yourself. You know, story, storytelling, you know, audience engagement, you know, being smart, being clever about how you do all that stuff can be just as influential to the brands. So if you're not in a school or a collective, you still have opportunities just the way I feel it. Oh, definitely. Um, and I think that that market for college athlete NIL deals is just going to continue to grow. Um, kind of as, as we talked about earlier, people are still getting used to what the rules are and this is for the brands too. And so they're kind of slowly moving into that, that market. And I think it's just going to continue to grow and they're going to, you know, brands are going to do more and more deals with college athletes. And it's not just the, the, the famous, well-known men's basketball and, and football players. It's going to be all kinds of athletes in, in all different sports. Yeah, so you kind of took a little bit of my thunder. I was going to ask you to rub your crystal ball and tell me where NIL is going to be in the future. But, uh, you know, clearly it's here to stay. You know, 
I think my opinion is, and some people agree, is that you know compliance is going to roll back a little bit. There's got to be some restrictions on some of this craziness, but the core principles of NIL are here to stay, and people are going to figure out how to take advantage of that. It's amazing how smart the human race is. But uh, if you were to look in the crystal ball, you know, where are we going to be in two or three years? What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, the number of deals will continue to grow. Like I said, as, as brands get more comfortable with it, um, it's possible we might have a federal NIL law in a couple of years. Um, there have been a few that have been proposed and the NCAA and other college sports leaders are, are definitely lobbying and pushing Congress to pass a federal NIL law. Um, I do think if we have a federal NIL law, it, it would help um, in increasing the number of deals. Not that they're not going to grow otherwise, but I think they would maybe grow even more just because then you're talking about one standard. Uh, everyone knows what that is. It doesn't matter what state a school's mm -hmm. in or, or an athlete is in. Um, and then I think another big question is, and this relates more to kind of the collective deals, um, is what what role is NCAA enforcement going to play in stuff like that? Um, they said they're going to start investigating some deals. So kind of remains to be seen what kind of resources they put behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, you're working as hard as you can in this space. And I know every time I uh, wake up in the morning, I reach for my phone and look for the latest news. It's daily, it's weekly. It's incredible how fast it's moving and how far we've come. And, you know, I, I just want to say again, thank you for participating today. But more importantly is thank you for um, agreeing to participate in our curriculum as a pillar leader. Uh, I believe that, you know, we're both fortunate enough that we were able to use athletics to better our lives and create opportunities. And, you know, the second part of my motto is to use athletics to uh, improve the lives of the people around us. And at the Players NIL, we are here for the student athlete first. And clearly your guidance and wisdom in our pillar course will be very, very important to us. And I want to thank you for agreeing to do that. And I can't wait to see your curriculum. Yeah, thanks for uh, bringing me on board and reaching out. I'm, I'm excited about it, you know, educating uh, college athletes, especially as a former college athlete myself on all of this stuff. Um, it's kind of a passion of mine. Um, as a college athlete, you know, you, you do have a big platform. People are going to pay attention to what you do and, and listen to what you do. So um, I think it's important, number one, to capitalize on that opportunity you have in that possibly short window of, of when people are paying attention to you. Um, and then also, like you said, use college athletics as a stepping stone, you know, for the rest of your life, whether that's financially with some NIL deals or, you know, just building a network of people um, to help you possibly get a job after college. Um, so it's definitely important to use that, that platform, that opportunity in the right way. Yeah, I agree. You know, we're focused on NIL, but these uh, five pillars that I've developed really are life skills, right? And uh, today's uh, student athlete is going to be tomorrow's business leader or business developer, or entrepreneur, and these skills will translate. So, well, Mitt, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to continuing to work with you and to develop uh, our project. And I wish you luck and I wish you well with all of your professional endeavors. Thanks, Mark. Looking forward to, to moving things in the future. Great. Have a great day. You too.